Section 8.6, the kinetic molecular theory of gases. We have a couple of postulates that go into this. Right? We're going to list them off. There are four of them, which would make a nice short answer type of question, wouldn't it? Uh, number one, the particles of a gas are so small compared to the distances between them that the volume of an individual particle can be assumed to be negligible or zero. So gases take up no space. Number two, the particles are in constant motion. The collisions of the particles with the walls of the container are the cause of the pressure exerted by the gas. The particles are assumed to exert no forces on each other, so there's no interaction, either attractive or repulsive. Four, the average kinetic energy of a collision of a gas particle is assumed to be directly proportional to the temperature in kelvins. We're also going to assume that all of these collisions are going to be perfectly elastic. In other words, they act like pool balls. One bangs into the other, they bounce off. That energy is going to be conserved. That momentum will be conserved. Uh, we are assuming they are not plastic. So if you like took a pool ball and you shot it into a tomato, right? The tomato goes gloop and the pool ball stays where it is. That is a plastic or deforming collision. All right. So let's do a concept check. You got two balloons and they got the same volume. One contains helium and one contains hydrogen. All right, let's complete this with the following phrases. So one's helium, one's hydrogen. We're going to write either different or same and justify our answer. The pressures of the gases inside the balloon are going to be the same. They're going to be the same because they're both in the same room. The temperatures of the gases in both balloons, if they're in the same room, will be the same, they're being held at the same temperature. The number of moles of gas in the balloon are, keeping in mind that they've got the same volume, right? then it's going to be the same. The densities of the gases in the balloon are different. The two gases have different molecular masses, and therefore, if they're the same volume with the same number of moles, they will have different masses, which means they've got the different masses divided by the same volume. They're going to have different densities. So let's look at our pressure and volume Boyle's law. For example, at a constant temperature, volume and pressure are going to be inversely proportional. As the volume of the gas decreases, the pressure is going to increase. So our pressure is going to be related to 1 over the volume, and then we've got nRT rolled together as a constant. According to the kinetic molecular theory, decreased volume implies that the gas particles will hit the wall of the vessel more often, therefore leading to an increase in pressure. According to the ideal gas law, for a constant volume, pressure is directly proportional to the temperature. So according to the kinetic molecular theory, as the temperature increases, the speed of the particles increase, and thus they will hit the wall with greater force, and that's going to result in greater pressure. All right, volume and temperature for Charles' law. According to the ideal gas law, for a sample of gas with constant pressure, volume is directly proportional to the temperature in kelvins. So our volume is going to be N, R over P times T, and these guys all get rolled together in that constant. So according to the kinetic molecular theory, at higher temperature, the speed of the molecules is higher. They hit the walls with more force. The pressure can be kept constant only by increasing the volume of the container. The ideal gas law states that the volume of a gas at STP is directly dependent on the number of gas particles. So our volume right, is going to be proportional to N, where N are or R, T, and P are constants. According to the kinetic molecular theory, an increase in the number of gas particles at the same temperature and volume leads to increased pressure because you've got more particles hitting it, so they're going to have more force. So its original pressure can be returned to its original value by increasing the volume. Okay. So if you take a gas cylinder and you increase the number of moles of gas, right? You've now got more collisions. You can increase the volume that is going to 
because force, because pressure is force per unit area, you've increased the area. By increasing the area, you bring the pressure back down. Right? In a mixture of gases, according to Dalton's law, the total pressure exerted by a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the pressures of the individual gases. And according to our kinetic molecular theory, all gas particles are independent of each other, and their individual volumes are unimportant. So that matches up. Our pressure can be expressed as the pressure is 2 thirds times n times Avogadro's number times 1 half the mass times the velocity uh, over the volume. So if our kinetic energy is equal to Avogadro's number times 1 half uh, m times the velocity squared, the expression for the pressure can be rewritten as our pressure is 2 thirds n times the kinetic energy divided by the volume, or P, P times V over N is equal to two-thirds of the kinetic energy. If you were going to go on in chemistry or in physics, stick a mental pin in this because you are going to come back to it, and you will see this two-thirds kinetic energy thing happening, happening again. Right? So according to the fourth postulate of our kinetic molecular theory, our kinetic energy are, is going to be proportional to temperature, right? Temperature, mole molecule speed is going to be related to the temperature. So our pressure and volume divided by the number of moles of gas is two-thirds of the kinetic, average kinetic energy, which is proportional to the temperature. Or our pressure times our volume divided by the number of moles of gas is proportional to temperature. And that's in agreement with the ideal gas laws and the postulates of the kinetic, mole kinetic molecular theory through the validity of that model. So let's talk about the meaning of temperature. According to the KMT, temperature in kelvins indicates the average kinetic energy of the particle. The exact relationship between temperature and the kinetic energy can be determined by combining those two equations. So our PV over N is equal to RT times two-thirds of the kinetic energy, and that yields that our kinetic energy is going to be two-thirds RT. Our root mean squared velocity, so if we take u with a bar over it, that represents the average of the squares of the individual velocities. And the square root of this average velocity is called the root mean squared velocity. And it's symbolized by u sub RMS. And our u sub RMS is going to be the square root of the square of the average velocities. The expression for our root mean squared velocity can be obtained by combining these equations. So the kinetic energy is equal to Avogadro's number times one half, the average mass times the velocity squared, and our kinetic energy is going to be two three halves RT. So our root mean squared velocity will get Avogadro's number times one half the average of mass times velocity squared is equal to three halves RT, or our Average squared velocity is equal to 3 RT over Avogadro's number times the mass. So our square root of the average squares is going to be our root mean squared velocity, which is going to be the square root of 3 RT over Avogadro's number times M, the mass, in kilograms of a single particle. And Na is the number of particles in a mole. All right. So that leads to this equation or the URMS, our root mean squared velocity, is going to be the square root of 3RT over M, where M is the mass of a mole of gas in kilograms. Right? And our final unit of expression is going to be in uh, meters per second. Right? So we'll write joules out in the long form of kilograms times meters squared per second squared, and we're going to end up with meters per second, and that's a unit for velocity. If we look at some of our molecular speeds for some molecules at a fixed temperature for 25 degrees C, we will notice a trend, right? So here we've got hydrogen, right? And its average RMS speed is going to be 1,960 meters per second. And down over here at this end, we've got carbon dioxide, which has an RMS velocity of 415 meters per second. Right? As you increase the molar mass of a gas, its root mean squared velocity is going to decrease. Now, if you think about what your kinetic molecular theory says, it says that for a given molecule, 
right? My pressure is force per unit area, and my kinetic energy is the component of force, right? And then Ke is one half mv squared. So you've got the same number of particles, but to keep them at the same pressure and hitting with the same force, that one mole of hydrogen's got to be going a lot faster than this one mole of carbon dioxide, right? So you're looking at a momentum based thing here. Right. When you look at the individual molecules, you can measure, if you took a microscope and you started to measure their speed and tabulated their speed, what you would see is a distribution of values. And the distribution of values is going to follow one of these you know, skewed Gaussian type curves. Right, you saw this with Wien's law, right? This looks very, very similar, th similar to uh, our black body radiator that we saw way back in our chapter about photons, right? So it's kind of following this Boltzmann-y distribution here. Um, and at 200 Kelvin, right, your speed is pretty slow. Right? This guy is my slowest, right? My average speed is pretty slow. And my guys are all kind of grouped tightly together. As I increase temperature, Right, the average, my most common value here, this guy's faster. It's moved up to, you know, about 2,500. Right, but it's spread out a lot more. It's going to get this distrib The area under these curves should be one, but the distribution. I'm going to get more that are going faster and less that are going slower, and so I'm going to flatten that curve out. It's going to flatten as the curve moves higher and the temperature increases. Right? We can calculate the root mean squared velocity for atoms in a sample of helium gas at 25 degrees C. So um, if we've got this guy working at 25 degrees C, which means that we're using 298 Kelvin as one of our knowns, we've always got our ideal gas constant. We can calculate the mass of a mole of helium in kilograms. Right? Remember, this guy has to be in kilograms when we do this. So we've got four grams per mole times one kilogram per thousand grams. So we get four times 10 to the minus three kilograms of helium per mole. Next, to calculate the root mean squared velocity of the atoms, we said that our root mean squared is going to be the square root of three times R, now notice this R here, this value of R, it's a little bit different, right? It's not 0 0.08206, right? That 0 0.08206 is in liters times atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Here when we're talking about energy, we're going to use this one that's got joules per mole Kelvin in it, not our liters atmospheres mole Kelvin R. Right, so there's a difference between those two R's, and make sure you grab the right one. So if you're talking about energy or velocity, you want the bigger R, right, the one with joules. If you're talking about just gas as an ideal gas law, this is our ideal gas R. Right. Um, once we throw all those guys together, we've got, we're going to divide by the uh, mass in kilograms per mole. And we end up with a square root of 1.86 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. Since the units of joules are in kilograms meters squared per second squared, our root mean squared velocity is going to be the square root of 1.8 times 10 to the 6th kilograms times meters squared divided by kilograms times second squared. Right? We're going to end up with 1.36 times 10 to the 3rd meters per second. Right? So those gases are really hauling butt, right? 1.3 times 10 to the third meters per second is 3,042 miles an hour, right? So an individual gas molecule is going to be moving very fast. Now, you may ask yourself at this point, if they're moving so fast, why, why don't we, why don't we, aren't, why aren't we knocked over by these, right? Why doesn't when somebody you know, opens a bottle of expired milk, do we not instantly detect it across the planet? 
Well, the reason for that has to do with diffusion and the fact that these molecules are in random motion. And so they're going to be moving forwards and backwards and to the side and back around and then a little bit forward. So they're going to be moving around in a random path. And it's not just a direct linear path. And that's why we're using that root mean squared. Right, so concept check, we can plot pressure versus volume at a constant temperature and number of moles. Right. So as my volume goes up, what happens to my pressure? My volume increases, I've got less area, my pressure goes down. If I look at the volume versus temperature at a constant number of moles, as my temperature goes up, my volumes go up. Gases expand when they get hot. If I look at the volume versus temperature at constant temperature, uh, in, in Kelvin, it's going to do the same thing. Uh, the volume versus moles, right, so if I increase my number of moles, my volume goes up at constant temperature and pressure. Right, so let's do a concept check. If you've got a sample of nitrogen gas in a container fitted with a piston that maintains a pressure of six atmospheres, initially the gas is at 45 degrees C in a container with a volume of six liters. All right, so this is our initial conditions. What is going to happen when the sample is cooled? Right. The volume of the gas is going to decrease. Right, That's Henry's law. So the volume is going to decrease when the temperature drops. This occurs because the molecules inside the container are going to slow down with a decrease in temperature. They're reducing the volume of gas to maintain that pressure. Calculate the new volume if the N2 sample is cooled at 15 degrees C. To do that, we'll just use Charles' law. We'll do V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over 288K. I'm going to rearrange. We'll get V2 is equal to V1 times P2 over P1. And we'll get 5.43 liters. All right, so it's a smaller volume than what we started with because our temperature is going down.